So how do you buy a house today in 2023? Well, buying a home is a large commitment. It is an awesome commitment. It is amazing, but it can come with some, um, some struggles as well. There are things like maintaining your home and there are some costs that are involved when you do purchase a home. So those are some other things to consider as well. But what I wanna go through today is just a couple steps on how do you know if you're ready to buy a home? Um, what What is the process like before you even start looking at a home? Those are all important things that we're gonna look at today. The number one thing you need to ask yourself when you are getting ready to buy a home or thinking about buy a home is, am I even ready? Is this the right time to buy a home? How do I know if I'm ready? Well, the first thing is, do you have enough income and do you have a steady income? You're not gonna get qualified for a mortgage loan if you don't have steady income and enough income. So that needs to be the first thing that has got to be in place is your income. Then how much debt do you have? Do you have uh, a lot of car debt? Do you have credit card debt? What are your student loans? Things like that. So what's gonna happen is your lender or your banker, whoever you go through, is going to look at your debt to income ratio to determine whether or not you qualify for a loan. So they're gonna take your debt and divide it by your gross income and that's gonna determine whether or not you even qualify to buy a loan. And that number needs to be 36% or lower. The lower your debt to income ratio or DTI as it's called, the better. Also the lower your DTI is, the more home you can afford. And then another way to know if you're ready is what is your credit score? The higher your credit score, the better interest rate you're gonna get, the more home you're gonna qualify for. Um, if you've got a credit score, I can't remember what the break is um, in, in there, if it's at 720 or 740, I can't remember, but um, the higher your credit score is, the lower your interest rate's gonna be. If you have a, a lower credit score, it could possibly mean that your interest rate is going to be a little bit higher. So you really want to know what your credit score is and talk to someone, I say always preferably to talk to a lender on ways that you can improve your credit score in order to get ready to buy. Number two is what can you afford? Okay, so there's what you qualify for, which is how much income do you have, how much debt do you have, and what your credit score is. That's how much you qualify for. But how much can you actually afford? What do you want to be paying per month for your mortgage? Typically, no more than 30% of your income needs to be going to your mortgage. And that's just not the principal or the interest on your mortgage, but you've got principal, interest, taxes, things like that, homeowner, uh, not, I'm sorry, uh, homeowner's insurance as well. So you really need to look at your budget and determine if even if your debt to income ratio is good and you qualify for a home, do you really want to purchase as much home as you qualify for? Or do you want to go a little bit lower um, to keep your budget a little bit healthier? Because that mortgage payment is something that has to be paid on time every single month. So how much are you willing to spend a month? Can you afford it? Number three, whenever you're going to purchase a home, there are two different things you're gonna need. You're gonna need a down payment, that's one, and then you're gonna need money for your closing costs. So down payment typically runs anywhere from three to, well, you could put, you could pay all cash, so that would be everything, but usually typically 3% to 20% of the contract price of your home is your down payment. That's also going to be determined um, by what type of loan you have. Um, if you have an FHA loan, you can put down as uh, you can put as little as three and a half percent down. If you have a conventional loan, you can put as little as three percent, most of the time five percent down. Of course, you can put more than that on either one of those loans. You can put twenty percent down. You can put fifty however much, but there are um, minimums that you do have to put down on a house. So do you have um, at least three to 5% of the contract price of a house to put down? Because you're gonna have to have that. That cannot be paid by the seller, that must come from you. And then also closing costs. Closing costs are things like prepaid insurance, prepaid taxes, lender fees, title fees, um, things like that, and maybe even HOA fees. Um, but those can run anywhere from typically 
it's two to three percent of the contract price so once again you know if the home is a hundred thousand dollars which we know it's not going to be <laughs> there aren't homes that much these days but let's just for the sake of math let's just say that it is uh so you know you're going to need uh two to three percent of that that's maybe up to three thousand dollars going towards your closing costs on a hundred thousand dollar home and then for a down payment if you're putting five percent down there's another five thousand that you're going to need um so you can do the math that if the home is five hundred thousand or four hundred thousand you're going to need like i said anywhere from three to five percent for down payment and then about two to three percent i would say three percent to be on the safe side for your closing costs so there's something called pmi or it's basically a mortgage insurance that is charged to you if you put down anything less than 20 percent um, if you're going with an FHA loan, if that's what you qualify for, you cannot drop uh, your mortgage insurance unless you sell the home. Um, but if you have a conventional loan, once you reach a certain amount of equity in your home, you can um, you know, call your service provider, your mortgage service provider and ask them, hey, can I have another appraisal done on my home? I think I built up enough equity to drop this mortgage insurance. But if you put down less than 20%, um, you have to pay a mortgage insurance on that because they want to guarantee that you're going to pay them back. Number four, make sure you find a good realtor, preferably someone that is local to the area. Your realtor is there to represent you. They have a fiduciary duty here in Texas. We have a fiduciary duty to our clients to represent them and to do what is in their best interest. The seller is going to have their own realtor and their realtor is looking out for their best interest, but you need someone in your corner. You need someone looking out for you. So you definitely want to make sure that you find a good realtor. Also, when you're buying a home, it doesn't cost you anything. The seller pays a full commission. And then from there, the, the listing agent and then the buyer's agent splits that commission. So it's no cost to you to use a realtor when you are looking to buy a home. Number five is finding a good lender. Your realtor hopefully will be able to recommend to you several, maybe uh, two or three um, good local lenders or local banks. Um, that is just something that's very important, at least for me and for my clients. I prefer to stay with a local lender, someone who I can call at nine o'clock at night. I have their cell phone. I'm not having to go through this big bank uh, corporation, um, a 1-800 number. I want to be able to call someone. I want you to be able to call someone when you need to as well. So your realtor should be able to connect you with a couple of lenders and then you choose whichever one you're comfortable with. I know for us, we have two or three that we use on a regular basis that we know, like, and trust that we refer out to our clients all the time. Of course, you're free to use whomever you choose, but just know that your local lender, if that's who you choose to use, more than likely, if other realtors are using that lender, they're gonna get that um, deal closed on time. So your lender is going to give you what's called a pre-approval, pre-qualification. You're gonna fill out some things typically online, but if they're local, maybe you can go in their office and talk face to face. I always like that, I think that's awesome, but most of the time it's gonna be online. You're gonna submit to them your income and your debt, and they are the ones who are gonna tell you what it is that you qualify for. And then they're also gonna tell you how much that monthly mortgage is going to be based on uh, what, um, what price of home that you're looking at. If you qualify for a $400,000 home or a $600,000 home, but you wanna stay 50 to 100,000 underneath that, let them know that and they can run the numbers on what does it look like to own a home at 350,000, 500,000, and 600,000. So just because you qualify, like I said, you might not be comfortable making that kind of payment. But that is what the lender is there for, is to qualify you and to run the numbers for you so you know what your mortgage is going to look like month to month. Okay, step number six. Okay, you've, you are ready to buy. You've already figured out your income. You've got income. You know what you can afford. You have chosen your realtor. You have spoken with the lender. You've gotten pre-qualified. You know what your budget is. Now here comes the fun part. It's time to start looking at homes. So one of the first things that's gonna happen is, um, if it's me, I'm gonna have already met with you one-on-one. -on -one. I like to meet with my clients. Um, I like to take them out for coffee or whatever it is that they like to get to know their dreams, their goals, everything about them when it comes to buying a home. 
Um, and then from there, we're gonna start sending you homes that, that are, match your criteria. Um, that is kind of the fun part. You kind of start to get, you know, you're fishing through all these houses online of things that you like. So we will make sure and get to know what it is that you want in a home. What are the deal breakers? What are some things that you can compromise on? So those are things that you're going to want to know when it's time to get uh, looking to buy a home. You're gonna to wanna to know all of those things. And just remember, more than likely, if this is your first home, it's not going to be your forever home or your dream home. And so it's likely that you're not gonna get 100% of every single thing that you wanted at home. And that's okay, because part of buying a home for the first time is to get you to where eventually in five, 10, 15, or 20 years, whatever that is for you, you are in that forever home. You are in that dream home because you are building equity as you are living in your home. So yes, you wanna know what is a priority for you. Does it have to have a pool? Does it have to have a fireplace? Does it have to have an island? Um, the size of the backyard? Um, you know, things like that. What are absolute deal breakers? And what are some things you're going to have to compromise on because either your budget just isn't where it needs to be in order to have everything you want or you and your spouse you and your partner just can't quite agree on everything so we need to know what's your criteria how many bedrooms how many bathrooms minimum square footage um, maybe there's a specific neighborhood or a school district that you have to be in you need to know what are your deal breakers and remember this is more than likely not going to be your forever home okay number seven you have found the house this is the one you are ready to submit an offer. So what's gonna happen after uh, you and your realtor have been out looking at homes is you're going to discuss what do you wanna offer. Your realtor is gonna run comparables on that home and homes that are very similar to it in that neighborhood and what those other homes have sold for. So we just wanna make sure that the price that the seller is asking is comparable to the market in that area. And from there, your realtor will suggest um, to you, you you know, you either offer what they're asking, you go in lower, or you go in higher because there's multiple offers. But there's other things about your offer than price that can make it appealing to a seller. And this is why it's important to use a, uh, a realtor that's working their business and that knows the market not someone who just sells a house once or twice a year to someone in their family because the market is constantly changing and it could actually cost you your home because your realtor doesn't know how to write up an offer that could be more competitive and it's not always just about price. There is some money you're going to need up front when you submit an offer, or actually once your offer has been accepted, there is some money here in Texas, we're talking about Texas because every state is different, but you're going to need what's called earnest money. Earnest money is also called like a good faith estimate. It's basically saying, I intend to fulfill my side of the contract. Earnest money is generally 1% of the contract price. So the contract is for $450,000. You're going to need a check for $4,500 and that's gonna be given to the title company. They're gonna hold on to that earnest money and you're gonna get that earnest money back when you close. It's gonna be credited towards your down payment and your closing costs that we talked about earlier. So it's not money that you're gonna lose. You will lose that money, however, if you back out of the contract for reasons that do not protect you. There are plenty of reasons that buyers are protected in a contract where they do receive their earnest money back, but if you do back out for reasons that don't protect you, then the seller keeps that 1% that earnest money. So it's very important that you're serious when you submit a contract that you plan on following through. Okay, here in Texas, we also have what's called an option period. In other states, it might be called due diligence, but here we call it an option period and it's negotiable. It's typically anywhere from, it could be as little as three days, which I do not recommend, up to 10 days. But typically it's about five to seven days um, where you pay a nominal fee somewhere around 200 or 300 dollars depending on the, the the cost of the home it could be a little bit more than that where you have the unrestricted right to back out for any reason so let's say it's five days you've paid two hundred dollars to have a five-day option period you wake up the next day after you are 
under contract, everything's official, and you just completely change your mind, you can back out and get your earnest money back. Remember that 1% we talked about. But that $200 or that option fee, that does go to the seller. Anytime you back out of the contract, the seller is gonna get that small um, option fee, okay? But that's what an option period is. It gives you the unrestricted right to back out for any reason whatsoever during that set amount of time. So those are two things that you're going to need. You're gonna need money for the earnest money and the option period. So you submit an offer and you're so excited. Well, what happens from there? Well, the seller can either accept your offer the way it is, they can completely decline it. If And that, that typically doesn't happen unless you submit an offer that is so low, that's so offensive to the seller, sometimes they might not even respond. They just, they decline, they're not even willing to negotiate. But most of the time what's gonna happen is they're gonna take your offer as is, or they're gonna counter offer. And it could be they're gonna counter offer on the price, or it could be that they're countering on the closing date, or maybe they don't want to help you pay for a home warranty. Or just, you know, there's other terms in the contract that they can counter, but, um, but pretty much they're either, gonna, they're either going to accept it or they're gonna counter, and then you can counter offer back and do that back and forth as many times as it takes until you both reach an agreement. I will say to be really careful and really be mindful of what kind of market you are in. If you're in a market um, where there's not a lot of homes for sale and there's a lot of buyers out there, be really careful that you're not fighting over you know a few thousand dollars because over the course of a 30 year loan, that's not really gonna affect you very much. Um, so just be very careful that you and your realtor are both very aware of what's happening in the market so you know how far to push the envelope when it comes to negotiations. Number eight, congratulations, you are under contract. Everything is official. Everybody has signed the contract and both agents have received it. It is what we call an executed contract. So now you're gonna have so many business days to get that earnest money and that option money turned in. That is very important. You wanna make sure your realtor really explains that to you very well. Because if you don't turn in that option period in time, then you don't have an option period, okay? During option period, there is something that's very important that you're going to want to do. You're gonna to wanna to have your home inspected by a licensed inspector. And here in the state of Texas, inspectors do have to be licensed. Your realtor should be able to recommend two to three licensed inspectors that they know, like, and trust. But of course, you are free to use a, a licensed inspector of your choice as well. So the inspector is going to come in during that option period. It's gonna take them a few hours to inspect the home. And then towards the end, they're probably gonna invite you into the home to go over what they found. From there, what you'll do is you'll decide if repairs even need to be done. There have been a couple of times where the house was just in such great condition that we didn't need to ask for anything to be repaired. But more than likely, there are some repairs that you're just going to want to have done. And we always say safety first is what you're gonna to wanna to look at. And then your big systems like your roof, your HVAC, your electrical, and your plumbing. Those need to be looked at very carefully. And your inspector will make recommendations based on what they find. Okay, so now you have the inspection report and you've listed maybe three or four things that you would like to have repaired before you continue on with this contract. So you are going to talk over, the, you and your realtor are gonna talk about that and they are going to submit those items that you would like to have repaired. Once again, the seller can say, nope, we're not repairing anything at all. You either continue and buy the house or you can go ahead and back out because remember you have the right to do so because you're still in that option period. Or the seller can come back and say, we'll repair it all. Or you just negotiate back and forth until you both can agree on what's gonna be repaired. Uh, sometimes what the seller will do instead of repairing those items is they will offer you money in lieu of repairs. And there's nothing wrong with that. It, it sometimes makes, makes it easier for everyone. However, I would recommend that if you are the buyer and the HVAC needs to be serviced because the inspector said, you know, it's great, it's running, however, it's really old, it needs to be serviced. That is not something I would take money um, in lieu of repair for because let's say it is serviced after you purchase the home, you decide to have it serviced because the seller gave you money towards that and there's a big repair. Now you're on the hook for it. So when it comes to HVAC, uh, my recommendation would be that you um, leave that part up to the seller to have serviced if that's a recommendation that the inspector 
has given on their report. Number nine, you are through option period, you have negotiated repairs, everything is good to go, you are moving forward with buying this house. This is kind of the long waiting period now. Um, you are waiting on your lender to get everything done, for the underwriters to get everything done, to make sure that you have full approval to purchase this home. They're going over your finances with a fine tooth comb. If you are self-employed, they are digging through your tax returns. Um, so that's what's happening um, during what I call just this long waiting period where it seems to just be silent. Um, is underwriters are making sure you actually can buy this home. Also during that time, the lender is going to order an appraisal on the home. Um, so an appraiser is gonna go out, they're gonna make sure that the contract price of the home, the price that you said you're gonna pay, that the home is actually worth that much. Um, and if the appraisal comes back either above that or below that, um, well, actually if it comes back above that, let's say the house is 450, and it appraises for 425, that's amazing. You just bought a home with equity. But really the goal is for your appraisal to come back right at or above what the home is in contract for. If the appraisal comes back below contract price, then you've got to renegotiate with the seller on what you're gonna do in that situation. Step number 10, you've gotten through option period. The appraisal has come in, the appraisal's been done. You are moving forward with this home. It is now time for what we call our final walkthrough. So typically either the day before or the morning of closing, you're gonna to wanna to have what we call a final walkthrough. Basically, you and your realtor are gonna walk through the home to make sure it looks the same way that it did when you entered into contract. You wanna make sure that there aren't big holes in the wall or things that are now there that weren't there before. There's no leaks anywhere. Um, pretty much that's just what you're gonna do. It's a very, very, very important thing to do because there have been times where we've gone through a final walkthrough and something was leaking, especially if the home is vacant um, or maybe the sellers have already moved out and during their move out, they really scuffed up the walls really bad or um, there's holes in the wall. So. Um, of course, there's going to be typical, you know, uh, some nail holes, maybe things like that. Um, that's typical, but you're really just wanting to make sure, does the home look the same way that it did when we entered into contract? Number 11, closing time. It is time to close. So you should have already at this point gotten what's called a closing disclosure from your lender. Uh, three days before closing, they're gonna send you a closing disclosure and it's gonna have all your numbers on it. Um, so you're gonna wanna make sure and review that with your realtor to make sure that the numbers that you were told um, during, you know, your, during all this process are the same or very close to as far as closing costs and things like that from what your lender told you. They're gonna give you that final number, that number you need to have wired to title or that cashier's check that you need to bring with you to title for your down payment and your closing costs. You wanna make sure that those numbers have not changed. Um, if there is some discrepancy in there, you definitely wanna let your realtor know uh, because you're the ones you're the ones who know that number because you're the one who has been talking to your lender this entire time. And make sure you talk to your lender and call your lender and ask them what's going on. These numbers don't seem to line up, but you should uh, get what's called a closing disclosure, uh, no less than three days before you close to make sure all the numbers are correct. And then it's closing day, hooray, we are all off to the title company. I like to accompany all my clients unless for some reason I am just out of town and I can't be there. I go to every single closing that I can attend with my clients because you know what? This is what we've been working so hard for. There are clients that we have worked with for two years or more waiting for them to be able to purchase a home and find the right one for them. Why would I not be there for you on closing day? That's what the accumulation of all of this has come to celebrating something huge with you. So it's closing time, it's closing day, and we're all at the title company together, um, not with the seller, usually in Texas, that's not how we do it, but signing those papers, and it is really just a fun and exciting time. And then last but not least, congratulations, you are now a homeowner. It is such an exciting time, I promise. It really is so much fun. And you know what? There are proven um, benefits to being a homeowner. Home ownership is a long-term financial investment. You are building equity in your home. 
Historically, homes have appreciated over time, so this is why you're building equity in your home. And the goal is either you stay there forever, and then in 30 years you've had this, you have this paid off property, you don't have a mortgage, and you bought at a price that's 30 years old. That's great. But if you are wanting to get into your dream home, getting into the market as soon as possible and starting out where you can, what you can afford, is building equity for the next home and the next home and the next home. So that's why it's considered a long-term financial investment because it does take time for that to happen. Home ownership also gives you a sense of security, stability, and control over your living space. It gives you the freedom to fix it up however you want to. Home ownership also fosters a sense of belonging and community. So home ownership truly is an awesome dream to realize. It does come, however, with things like maintenance. You've got to maintain your property when you own a home. If you don't maintain your property and then you get ready to sell your home, you're not gonna get out of it as much as you could if you, if you would have just done some maintenance over the course of the years that you were in your home. So yes, home ownership is a fun thing to do. You get to paint the walls whatever color you want. Um, you get to plant things in your garden and watch them grow. Um, you get to build equity in your home. But yes, it does take time and it does take money to maintain your home. So you do wanna make sure that you are ready for those things as well. So there you have it. A couple of steps on are you ready to buy a home and what does it look like once you're under contract? Like I said, we get calls all the time from people just like you ready to buy a home. So we would love to, to connect with you, to take you out for coffee if you're local, or connect with you on Zoom if you would like to talk to us about what it looks like for you to buy a home. We'll see you on the next one.